don't know how big this room is anymore, but I feel like I'm in a very big forest that just goes on forever. I really don't like it in here. I really would like that door to be opened. What are you doing? What are you oh. doing? I'm trying to block out the rest of the world. There's a much better way of doing that. Really? Time for investigation ouch. We all have senses. They tell you what's going on around you, and then your body knows what to do. Like... telling your feet to dodge people in the street. Looking both ways before crossing the road. It's all about your brain receiving data and deciphering it to help you function in our busy world. Even the smell of that bread is making me hungry. Your brain is like a supercomputer, receiving around 2,000 bits of information a second and processing it all without you even noticing. But what if we were to completely shut off all the data that your brain receives? Just like pulling the plug on that computer. Well, I'm about to do that to my brain right now. And I'm a little bit scared. I'll be doing it in here. This is an anechoic chamber. Normally, it's used to test sound equipment, but scientists often use these chambers when studying sensory deprivation. It's designed to deaden any noise, so there's absolutely no sound inside at all. This is totally alien for a human being. I'll have to be careful. This foam all around me absorbs all the echoes. Now, you might not have noticed this, but you hear echoes all the time. The echoes will allow you to tell whether you're in a sports hall or whether you're in your bedroom, even with your eyes closed. But in here, it's completely different. This room will prevent any outside sound from reaching my ears. So when that door closes, it's silence. And soon I'll be finding out what that's like. But worse still, the lights are going to go out too. I'll be practically senseless. How will I cope? Let's speak to an expert. This is Dr Oliver Mason. He's a psychologist at University College London and has done lots of studies on what happens to the brain inside anechoic chambers. So what do you think is going to happen to me in there? Well, your sense of hearing may become more sensitive. In fact, all your senses may alter and you may even hear things that strictly aren't there. So you mean even if there's no sound, I might still hear things? That's right, because our mind may create uh, something for us to experience because there's nothing actually happening. In fact, it can be so disturbing for the mind that some people totally freak out. So we've taken some special precautions. So Oliver and James are going to be monitoring me while I'm in there. They've given me a safe word, which is ouch, and I can say that at any time and they'll let me out. Now I've got this camera with me, so you're coming too. Let's go. Some people manage up to half an hour in this alien environment, some just a few minutes before they shout their escape word. Let's see how long I last. I'm now watching it closed. It's actually pretty scary. Everything is now very quiet. So it's hard to imagine there's anything outside this room now. I can't hear any other noises. So the first thing that's really strange about this is it feels like my brain almost can't stay still. So I'm listening very, very hard for noises now. I really want to hear things. So I can hear something like birds chirping or like a waterfall maybe, like a high-pitched kind of chattering sound. That's because my brain is trying to make sense of this place. It thinks there must be sound, so it hears it. But there's nothing here. Starved of sensory data, I'm developing spidey senses. But I can hear my heart beating in my ears. I can still hear my voice, but it's not my normal voice. What happens if I shout? Hello! Nothing. It's really, really weird. So it's, it's like I'm shouting into a huge valley and nothing comes back. Everything I say disappears immediately. Now, most of the information the brain receives is through sight. So what would happen if I had none? It's something I'm about to find out. So he's probably even more disoriented now. He not only can't hear anything, he can't see anything either. I can hear my stomach gurgling. 
I can see little flashes of light at the corners of my eyes. I can hear these other noises in my ears. It's all very strange. So now I'm seeing things and hearing things. Deprived of its normal data, my brain is reaching out to make sense of this alien scenario. But without its main stimuli, it's confused and I'm becoming disoriented. I don't know how big this room is anymore, but I feel like I'm in a very big forest that just goes on forever. I really don't like it in here. I really would like that door to be opened. Ouch. Did they hear me? I hope that'll make the door open. Are they still there? And that is a welcome sight. I feel like a bit of a baby now. I wasn't really scared. I wasn't scared, actually. Half an hour in there felt like a lifetime. So it is very bright out here. And the other thing is it's really loud. Like, I can hear my voice. I can hear lots of other sounds, but I can mainly hear my voice very loudly. Like, it's echoing off everything. Um, yeah, I am very pleased to be out. So I quite enjoyed the 15 minutes in the light, but when the lights went out, it was like a nightmare. Nightmare is a really good point of comparison because your brain's probably in something of a similar state in there. It's got nothing to go on and everything comes from the brain. That's right, we've shown the brain needs sensory data to function. It just shows how much information my brain's getting every single minute of the day and processing without me even knowing it. So when you take those things away, things get very weird indeed. Of course, I'm not, I'm not really afraid of the dark. <laughs> and now to our lab. Oh! Where we do incredible experiments. Oh, it's disgusting. To show you how your body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today's lab is all about fluorescence. Our teeth are glowing under ultraviolet light. Ooh, yours are blue. Am I green? No. So what's going on? Well, it's complicated, but... You see light in a spectrum from red through yellow, then blue, then violet, and beyond violet is ultraviolet, which we can't see. But in our bodies... We have molecules that are absorbing the UV light from these torches right now and doing something brilliant. The electrons and molecules in my teeth get all excited, and when they calm down, they release a special light that only shows up when these torches are on. This is called fluorescence. So, in normal light, your teeth look like this, but if we lower the light, they look like this. And that's because the molecules in your teeth are emitting a fluorescent light that you can't normally see. But something else in your body is fluorescent too. Oh. Yes, these are escaped splashes of wee. Not very hygienic, but useful for our experiment. Best not to try this yourself, we're experts. Some of the waste molecules that come out in your pee also absorb the ultraviolet light, and they become fluorescent too. Oh my goodness, people have been careless. Wait, Chris, haven't you been using this toilet all day? Sand! So, if we fluoresces under our UV torches, you know what this means, don't you? What? That your body makes invisible ink. Wow, of course! We're going to do a very special experiment, but we're under laboratory conditions. Chris, we're in a toilet! Look, all I'm saying is we can only do this because we're doctors, we're a little bit silly, and we're wearing protective gear. So, now that we've got Zahn's Wii, it's on with the invisible ink experiment. I'm going to ask Zahn three body-related questions, and he's going to write the answers in his Wii. But we won't see what he's writing because we're about to prove that Zahn's Wii is invisible ink. It's quiz time! Question one. What is the only part of the body that can't repair itself? It's a toughie, this one. Will Dr Zahn get it right? I'm done. Second question. What is the body's largest organ? This is a good question. I know this one. Are you done? I'm done now. Good. Finally, how many litres of urine does the average human produce every day? Hmm. The amount of wee you produce is very related to how much you drink in a day. That's the end of quiz time. It doesn't look like you've painted anything. No, I have. It's right there in my own wee. I did it. No, I know, I know. You've painted in your own urine. That's why we can't see it. But 
If we turn on the ultraviolet light, it'll reveal how many Zans got right. There you go. Yeah, look at that. Now you can see my answers. The molecules in the Wii are fluorescing after absorbing UV light. So question one was, what's the only part of the body that can't repair itself? Peep. Well, actually, it's the enamel. Which I think we'll give you the point. Yes. Question two, what is the body's largest organ? Skin. The skin is right. Finally, how many litres of urine does the average human produce in a day? I put three. Three is wrong. Uh, the answer is 1.5. So I pee twice as much as an average person. That's right. Well, you probably drink twice as much as the average person. Anyway, two out of three isn't bad. Let's turn on the lights. You see the writing's disappeared now. So we've shown that molecules in your body fluoresce after absorbing UV light. You've actually got invisible ink inside your body. And this fact was discovered years ago. Urine used to be used by spies as invisible ink to write secret messages that could go undetected by the enemy. Still a bit smelly, though. Sand. Ever wondered why you have to go to sleep? Ever heard someone snore so loudly the room rumbles? We're about to tell you why. This is a case for investigation ouch. You spend a third of your life doing absolutely nothing. I'd hardly call picking my nose nothing. I'm not talking about your disgusting personal habits. I'm talking about sleep. All animals do it, including us, and it's essential for life. So to find out more about it, we're going to bed. To discover what happens when we sleep, we're spending the night in this special sleep clinic. But first, we need to get wired up by a team of sleep experts. All this equipment will give us information about what our bodies do when we sleep. I suppose you're also going to have your bear wired up. Of course I am. Mr Grumble has a lot of trouble sleeping sometimes. Monitoring us will be sleep expert Dr Wahab Dehemek. So sleep is not just sleep. There are different types of sleep. Absolutely. And some of the types of sleep relax your brain and recharge that, and other types of sleep recharge your body. Basically, yes. And that's what we, that's why we need sleep. Night, Chris. Night, Zand. It's time for us to go to sleep. Dr. Waheb sets the computers up to record the night ahead, and I'm hoping this will prove, once and for all, that Zand snores. He's always denied it. Mr. Grumbles knows I never snore. No, Mr. Grumbles. In a single night, your brain cycles through different types of sleep every 90 minutes until you get up. You'll start with a light sleep. This lasts around 20 minutes, and your breathing and heart rate slow down. You can still be easily woken at this stage. Then you fall into a deeper sleep. It's at this stage where some people walk or talk in their sleep because their body is still active, even though their brain is resting. And then you start REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement. It's in this stage where your brain is organising itself, and you'll have a dream or two. And then your body repeats this sleep cycle about four or five times in a night. Next morning, and it's time to get up. Other people say I snore, but I really maintain that I don't. I think they're all liars. All will be revealed shortly, Zand. I didn't sleep very well at all. We're both looking a bit weary. Oh, dear. Let's find out why we're both so tired. Chris, this line here, that's for when you were awake, and then here you slept, that's different sleep staging, and then here you were awake, and then you slept again, and then you were awake. So in terms of a good night's sleep, I only had, what, two and a half hours? Although I was in bed for six hours, I only was actually asleep for two and a half, and that is just not enough. And not only does my body feel very tired, my brain feels really thick-headed and unrested as well. So how did mine compare to Chris's? You had more sleep. And how long did I sleep? Four and a half hours. So I got twice as much sleep as you. But even four hours sleep isn't enough for your body to rest, especially when you're young. Children need at least eight hours because you're still growing and your body needs to work harder. Chris and I are adults and we can get away with less, but it still makes us feel very tired. What about dreaming? How do we compare on that? Well, Chris, uh, I don't think you had a dream at all. Xand, you had two. Although I had a full sleep cycle, it was pretty restless, and I just didn't dream, which can happen sometimes. But look at this section of the graph. 
I had lots of rapid eye movements, and this suggests that I was dreaming. How long were the dreams? They, they well, short dreams, or...? One of them is half an hour, was half an hour. Really? Yes. Half an hour of dreaming? What about snoring? You did a snore, Zand. I did? Yeah. OK, Zond, there's the proof. You do snore. Oh, dear. How much of the time was I snoring? 7% of the night. Not everyone snores like me, but people who do snore can't move air freely through their nose or mouth during sleep. So the air vibrates against the relaxed muscles in their throat and nose, and that's what makes that snoring sound. You sleep for a third of your life, but you're not doing nothing while that's going on. You're recharging your brain and you're recharging your body. So if you don't get enough sleep, that's going to affect everything you do and you'll feel absolutely rubbish. How many dreams does the average person have in a year? Is it the equivalent of A, the number of baked beans in a tin, B, the number of miles from Newcastle to Rome, or C, the number of planes leaving Heathrow each day? In fact, the answer is B. It's 1,460 miles from Newcastle to Rome, and you have 1,460 dreams in a year, which means you could be having up to four dreams every night. Ouch. What part of your body do you think this comes from? Is it A, your intestines, B, your eyes, or C, between your toes? The correct answer is B. They're cells called cones and rods from inside your eyes. Wow! Ouch. Today, we're taking a good look at the cells in your eyes. Hello. Did you know that you can see things that you're not even looking at? Try it. Keep your eyes fixed on my nose in the middle of your screen. Now, without moving your eyes from my nose, you'll notice that you can still see other things in the room around you. Perhaps you can see the television remote. Perhaps you can see a fish in a tank. Perhaps you can see your identical twin brother, Dr Zahn, picking his nose at the lab bench as usual. <laughs> now, they'll seem a bit fuzzier than normal, but you can see these things out of the corner of your eyes, which is why I know that Dr Zahn is still picking his nose. <laughs> Well, that's because our eyes use two types of vision at the same time. Central vision, which is here, and peripheral vision, which is all the way out here. So this is your peripheral vision area. If you were in the lab looking here, this would be your central vision area. And Zond and I would be in your peripheral vision area, looking grey and a bit distorted. Because you're watching us on a screen, you're actually seeing everything with your central vision. But we've altered this image to highlight what your peripheral vision sees. Phew, back to normal. But what is going on? Why do things in your central field of vision look different to things in your peripheral vision? Well, it's all to do with the cells in your eyes called cones and rods. Now, come here and stand on my eye. OK, but you're going to have to lie down and no, maybe no, no, I can... Not that eye, this eye. <laughs> So that's what you did with all the gloves. Now, this is exactly what an eye looks like if you cut it in half. Well, it's not, is it? I mean, it's massive and it's made of green gloves. So this bit at the front here, this is the pupil or the black hole at the front of your eye, and light comes in here through the lens and hits the back of your eye or the retina. The retina covers most of the inside surface of your eye. And remember this picture? This is what the surface of your retina looks like magnified under a very powerful microscope. These cells are called rods, and these are called cones. We're going to show you how they help you see. Your cones, I'm rods. Let's make a retina. Your red cone receptors are great at seeing colours and details in bright light. You have around six to seven million of them in each eye, and they give you your central vision, which is why there's a higher number of these super cones in the centre of your retina. Your blue rods are found at the edge of your retinas. You have around 120 million of them in each eye. They make up your peripheral vision so you can see things out of the corner of your eye. Now, we're going to show you just how important your peripheral vision is. Zond, you're going to need these. The DXPVRG Dr. Zand Peripheral Vision Removal Goggles. Now, I've put some blinkers on Zand so he can't see out of the corner of his eyes and he has only the use of his central vision. How are you doing, Zand? Well, I'm pretty annoyed, actually. I mean, you've stolen my peripheral vision. That's right, but it's all in the name of science. Now, to understand what Zand's seeing, put your hands around your eyes like this. 
It's an effect called tunnel vision, where you can only see what's straight ahead of you. We're going to see how much difference this makes to Zahn's vision in the Stacking Beakers Pyramid Peripheral Vision Challenge. So, in this challenge, we have to pick up these beakers... What beakers? ..and fill them with water from this bucket... What bucket? ..using this jug. What jug? ..and then stack them into a neat pyramid, and whoever gets there first will be the winner. Look, I think I'm going to find this quite difficult. I mean, I can't even see... Enough excuses, Zand. Are you ready? No, I can't even know what my bucket Go! is! Go! Let's see how much difference our peripheral vision really makes. This is really difficult. I have to keep turning my head. We take our peripheral vision for granted, but everyday tasks would be much more difficult without it. Now, I'm finding this challenge particularly enjoyable, mainly because I'm beating Zand, but also because I don't have to move my head around a lot, because I have my peripheral vision. Zand, you're not doing all that well. Ah! Hurry! I'm doing my Hurry. best! Hurry! Fill those beakers! What's really difficult about this is that I can't see the table very easily, and then I don't know where I'm going when I get back. And then I miss the jug. I have to keep looking at the cup, look at the jug, make sure they match. I'm trying to do it all in a hurry. OK, hold on, Zand. I'm going to pause this competition while I'm ahead and make it much harder for you. What? Lights, please. <laughs> now I can't see anything. Now, because I have my peripheral vision, it's easy for me to see in the dark because my rod cells, the edges of my retina, are more sensitive to light. My cones are really designed for working in bright sunshine, and so in this dark, I'm making an absolute mess. Come on. Come on, Zand, you can still do it. I reckon I can catch Ta-da! Oh! Oh! Lights up! Hmm, that didn't quite go to plan. So we've shown you how you can see things out of the corner of your eyes at the same time as looking at something in front of you. And we've also shown you that the rod cells that make up your peripheral vision help you see in the dark. Well, Zahn, that challenge was thirsty work. Could you please pass me a full cup of water as... <laughs> what are you doing? Well, don't blame me, Chris. Blame the DX PVRGs, available in shops everywhere. <laughs>